All I can say is, wow, this is a conversation that you do not want to miss. We sat down today with Mike Abel, world-renowned and respected business leader and speaker. We spoke about why giving is so important to him and why he's made it a pillar of his life, how he built successful businesses, where he sees the future of South Africa and our incredible potential, the fact that as a country, we lack nothing. This is a conversation that will uplift you and inspire you. It will remind you of the good things in life. We touch on what we should all be doing to help empower and develop the youth of our country who are our future and our foundation. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. This is one that I tell you, you will be playing over again and again. Thank you for joining me today. Awesome. Mike, thank you for joining us and uh, sorry for coming late. Uh, <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's really, it's a big honor for me to have you on. And I realized when we were chatting about the jacket, I actually put the wrong jacket on. I've got a bright orange one, which I think you may have seen that I wore to the One Achievers Awards. And I wanted to wear that because the reason I wanted to wear it was whenever I read a post of yours or we have an interaction, it's always bright and light and colorful. And that's sort of, that's how I think of you. Um, you know, you always sort of brighten up every situation. I don't think you've, even in some of the more um, concerned media posts that you put out, it's always bright and energetic. And uh, it, it, I appreciate it that. Thank you. So, very, very cool. So, Mike, can you give us a little bit of background? Who are you? Who is Mike? Well, uh, I'm a PE boy. Yeah. <laughs> a herald from uh, Krabeja and uh, as my parents are both also Port Elizabethans. I don't know what the plural is for people who come from Kwabeja. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> GQers. Yeah. Uh, style. Okay, I love <laughs> it. Exactly. There we go. There we go. Exactly. Uh, so, um, yeah, I uh, finished school in uh, 1984. So I've got mm -hmm. my 40 year reunion coming up. Um, wow. okay. you know, I still see myself as 35 in my own mind. So the bald man looking back on the camera tells yep. me different. <laughs> uh, I've been in advertising and community. I, I studied marketing and, and advertising. And then I've been right. in the industry for 35 years now. So three and a half decades of uh, wow. working across brands back in the day. Um, at the White House, DDB uh, worked on Woolworths and the repositioning of Woolies from the old store back then, which you might remember, I'm not sure, yeah. being a youngster with a gray background and the purple writing of Woolworths to yep, um, absolutely. what it looks like today, really, 40 right. years, uh, you know, 30 something years later. And then sure. many, many years at Ogilvy. I was with them for about 15 mm. years. Right. Running the Volkswagen account and working on Shell and uh, then BP and Old Mutual and South African breweries for many years. And then I went to go and run the MNC Saatchi Group in Australia as their CEO and uh, and then returned in right. um, December 2009 to start MNC Saatchi Able and our group of companies in South Africa. So really an ad man, I'm, uh, I guess, an op optimist I am yeah. an activist and uh, yeah, I do a lot of writing and public speaking. So that's a little bit about who I am, I guess. Okay, fantastic. So just a question on that. What mm -hmm. got what made you choose advertising? I think it's quite a stressful so, yeah, choice. Yeah, yeah. So when I went up, when I went to varsity, I started off actually uh, studying architecture uh, because that's what I wanted to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then very quickly, I think it was when I got this huge fat book called the fundamentals of plumbing that I decided maybe it wasn't for me because I thought I was going to be designing the Guggenheim, not where the, you know, the bogs go. Yes. So um, uh, not being as resilient, I guess, as I should have been in those days, but always having a love with creativity and for creativity. Um, I then thought, well, I'll become a, a psychologist because I like right. solving problems. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, and then let me see where that takes me because again it's a different type of a creativity it's a creativity in problem solving which uh, which I still do 
Right. And then I didn't enjoy that either. And then my brother was studying marketing and I was more interested in his textbooks than my own. Uh, and I guess why I've ended up in, um, in marketing and advertising and communication is I've always been deeply in love with ideas. Right. And, uh, and that's what we are. We're commercial psychologists. So we understand creativity and we understand the art of persuasion and we understand problem solving. And then it's a perfect way of converging, I guess, all of those things into one. Right. Fantastic. How, how was that as a young kid growing up convincing your parents that you wanted to change uh, from one course to another? I'm very fortunate because I had ever patient parents. Mm -hmm. So they believed in me and they backed me. And right. they felt that if this is what I decided to do, it was probably the right thing for me. And that is because I think from a very young age, probably 11 or 12, my dad had retail stores in PE. And I used to work in his shops uh, every Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, selling furniture, couches, lounge suites, delivering them, you know, up staircases as a picky. Um, right. <laughs> they saw that I had a, a work ethic. They saw right. that, you know, I wasn't a lazy chap. I was mm -hmm. lazy with my mm -hmm. home, with my homework, but not lazy in life. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think they believed in me. Absolutely fantastic. That, that's such a valid point that I'd like to touch on because, mm. you know, for you, how important, and I, and I think it speaks to, you know, with what you're wanting to do and the energy that you're wanting to bring into South Africa and yeah. the, the, the development of opportunity. Sometimes we, we struggle with academics. I'm dyslexic. I really, you know, I always love talking to accountants because I can tell them I hold the record at Camps Bay High in Standard 7 for my accountancy results. I went up 30% and I still failed. <laughs> <laughs> From 2% yeah. to 32.7%. It was fabulous. So, An improvement. Yeah. And, and growing up, like, with struggling with academics, I, I believed I was stupid. And that can really hold you back. In, yeah. in the South African context, I mean, how important is an academic qualification, do you think, to long-term success in someone's life? Well, I think it all depends on what you want to do with your life, you know. So certain degrees um, are um, absolutely, you know, um, reliant on mm -hmm. uh, getting a great matric. You just won't gain yes. access to university. You know, you want to become a, a doctor or you want to go and study actuarial science. You want to do any of those things. And, I, and I'll come back to your question specifically. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that um, unless you do well at school, it still is a natural um, excluder yes. from you know, following your heart or following your passion. Um, irrespective if you might have a particular bent or passion or ability in that area. So there are limitations, and I think that in many ways it is changing now finally, but we still do have a Victorian school system in many mm. ways that, you know, is designed around a cookie-cut approach. Um, the exciting thing now is that um, there are different forms and styles of learning, whether it is online learning, uh, they now for the first time recognize that there's a difference between an auditory learner and a visual learner. Mm -hmm. And you might have been a great um, auditory learner, yep. Nick, and not a, a good visual one. You know? yep. um, and, uh, and so people are getting their heads around the fact, I mean, um, kids that are dyslexic, I know a number of people who are dyslexic who are spectacularly mm. clever human beings, you know, mm. um, and, and the one is unrelated to the other. It's, it's a challenge or an impediment in a conventional system, but it's not an impediment in intelligence in any shape right. or form. And so when you look at people like, uh, be it um, Richard Branson, for example, mm. You know, he probably wouldn't pass the entrance um, interview for Virgin. Virgin wouldn't employ the man that founded the company. Right. You know, many such examples. Um, right. So I think that what you want to do always um, within the workplace or as a parent or, or, or for oneself is to always play into one's strengths. Um, because those are the things that need to compensate if there are any perceived weaknesses. Right. Uh, so that would be that would be my advice. But I definitely think that there is an epiphany happening in education and a lot of conversations happening that are going to change the model dramatically. Uh, and those that don't adapt um, won't survive. 
Right. If you were to speak to young people today, perhaps um, a group of youth that didn't yeah. achieve academically and then maybe didn't even know what they really wanted to do because yeah. coming from poverty, they just, they just want a job. They just want to be able to support their family. What would you say to them? I think the most important thing is to try and determine what you like, mm. what you mm. are interested in naturally. Because I think that that is the only thing that actually makes people enjoy what they do. Um, right. And right. I think that one needs to spend time, um, whether it's a, an online test, and I understand there are a lot of challenges today in terms of even mm -hmm. being aware mm -hmm. that such a, a thing might exist in terms of an aptitude test or, you know, uh, trying to get to know yourself better. You know, there are challenges even for somebody to even have data in yes. terms of access to do, you know, those types of tests. So there are very many barriers. Uh, and I was actually having a conversation on my podcast the other day with a lady who was telling me what it costs to apply for a job. Uh, and she's a very brilliant accountant. And I'd never actually thought of the cost of applying for a job. Right. So there are so many barriers uh, in, in, a, in a country that has got such uh, poverty and unemployment mm. in terms of actually pulling yourself out of that situation. But um, I definitely think that that is key is, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure um, and especially in uh, emerging um, uh, economies where parents will encourage their children to choose a traditional career. Yes. So don't go into advertising, for example, because there's very little knowledge of advertising as a lucrative career. Yes. So choose the, choose the traditional ones, become a teacher, become a doctor, become a nurse, become an accountant, become a whatever. And then the person isn't happy in that job. They're not enjoying the right. job. And so they're never going to be, re you will never be good in a job that you don't enjoy because yes. the good or the great comes from passion. It doesn't come from knowing how to do the job. And on that point, what, what motivates you? What keeps you going when times are tough, when there, there are challenges sort of in the business? and in life well when this shit really hits the fan if i'm allowed mm. to use a word like that yeah. on your podcast on the pod <laughs> we'll we'll just go tick yes there is an excuse okay cool, <laughs> cool, cool. yeah uh, you know um my deeper said you know um at his hardest times what he did was you know he kept his face to the sun and he put one foot in front of the other and that mm. is sometimes mm. what you just need to learn to do in life the other thing I've trained myself to do is to understand that negativity precipitates nothing positive. There's no way of getting anything good out of being negative. So mm. although it's sometimes hard not to be negative, you can't allow yourself to go there. You need to almost train your mind um, not to allow you to wallow in self-misery because yes. it's not going to improve your situation. It's not going to solve the problem. So when the proverbial hits the fan, you see, I caught myself that time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I do think uh, problems um, are essential to purpose and problems yes. are essential to growth. And so then I look at it and I reframe it and I say, what can I learn out of this? How can I approach it differently? Not always easy. And I'm right. not making light of it. And, uh, and certain problems, of course, are of... Uh, of an insolvable nature when they come to certain health conditions and whatever that might be. But where you can solve that problem, look at how and where. And I think a positive mindset always is critical. I think right. if, you're not, if you're not optimistic and positive, your chances of solving it are pretty low. I think you don't look for the opportunities that don't exist yet. If you're always looking at the negative, you know, positive, you're forced. So how, how do you well you do you find you find opportunities in the in the problem that's yes. where problems live yeah absolutely problems don't live when things are going perfectly well such nobody's a good looking point. for solutions then yeah absolutely <laughs> there, there are no problems without opportunities exactly <laughs> well, there are no, yeah yeah that's absolutely and vice, versa, exactly. and vice versa so for for you how do you develop a positive mindset? Is it something that you're born with? Is it something that you choose? How, how does one sort of develop it and maintain it? I definitely think that um, I have been blessed to an extent with a sunny disposition, mm -hmm. as my late grandmother would have described her grandson. So I know from being a small boy, I've always been 
you know, mm -hmm. a positive and a happy person. Uh, and I do think that that is uh, a very fortunate thing. You know, uh, it's a mm -hmm. gift that was given to me, I guess, just to be, you know, happy. Right. Um, but um, I definitely think that you can not train yourself to be happy per se, but focus on the good and focus on mm -hmm. what feeds your soul and um, and push yourself into that space deliberately. Right. And I know that a lot of people are happy when they're miserable. You know, yeah. I know some people that are only happy when they're miserable. Yes. That for them, unless they can see the pitch black lining around the cloud, they're yeah. not happy. And, you know, they wish that silver lining away instantly. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, I choose, yeah. I choose not to hang around with those people. I choose not to spend time with negative people because uh, positivity is contagious and so is mm -hmm. negativity. Mm -hmm. So on that point, for you, I mean, and you, you said it, how important it is, but if we could talk about that a little bit, how important is your social group? How important in choosing the life you want are the people you surround yourself with? I think critically important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, people who are constantly down and people who are uh, and it's not because they've got problems, of course. Like mm. you know, if you've got if you've got a friend who develops a problem and they are in a bad emotional way, um, I'm not remotely suggesting move on. I've had yep. you know my closest yes. friends today, or my closest friends I've had my whole life. Yes. Um, yes. But I do think that what's really important is if people have a propensity towards negativity, uh, they are best to be avoided. Right. Um, I would. I won't hire negative people. Um, my mm. partners in the company are, by and large, positive and happy people. Um, and also, I don't like people who um, um, are unnecessarily needy. And what okay. I mean, what I mean by that, and I'll explain it to you, mm. is a victim mentality. Yes. I think unless you're prepared to kind of dig yourself out of that hole. If such, a, if such a, an expression does exist in itself, because by definition, you'd be going deeper if you're digging yourself out of a hole. But assuming it does, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Use the dirt to build stairs. Yeah, maybe you put in the sand into the hole so that you can stand you on stand it up, to yeah. elevate yourself. That's the only way I can understand Absolutely. the physics of it, or the science of it. But um, yeah. that to me is the important part. The important mm. part is... Um, is not to have a victim mentality and not right. to work with insecure people. And right. what I mean by insecure people is, of course, we all have insecurities. That's a different story. Mm. But insecure people are bad leaders of other people because they put their stuff onto other people. Right. You know, um, and you never want to be a victim of somebody else's childhood. Sure. Absolutely. It's, it's so important. I talk about, you know, understanding the the way that people interact with us is based on their experience and how they see the world. And it's not an indication of who we are, you know, where, where we go Absolutely. through difficult things. It's not an indication of who we are. Fantastic. Well, more often than not put people, uh, you know, um, judge you by their values, not yes. yours. Absolutely. You know? and, Absolutely. And then you just need to understand that. And, uh, and if it doesn't fit to move on, mm. there's no point yeah. taking something on that doesn't belong to you. Taking on somebody's project, somebody yeah. else's project, that's you, you know, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned coming back to South Africa from yes. Australia. Yes. What was behind that decision? Uh, it was a very simple thing. Mm -hmm. um, my mm -hmm. wife um, hated living away from her parents and her sisters okay. and mm -hmm. her nieces and nephews, and she wanted to be back and her friends. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So mm -hmm. she made a um, I guess, a logical reason to leave, and she made an emotional decision to come back. Right, fair enough. That, you know, it's, what do we, we get told when I'm, I spend 15 years selling insurance, and we get to, we told people justify on reason, but they act on emotion. And uh, yep. that's it. But it's such an important point, because, you know, particularly if we look at South Africa and, and where things are, People I sense tend to forget the value of family and community in, in terms of one's mental health and happiness and quality of life. How important is that? Um, I think I hadn't understood it uh, entirely because I am a very rational person. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, mm -hmm. I'm emotional. I've got a, I've got, 
if I can say that of myself, a big heart. You know, I care about people deeply. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, that's very yeah. obvious with you, by the way, just from <laughs> having spoken <laughs> to you, people who you. know you. And, uh, yeah. yeah. No, and no, I do. Um, and so for me, um, I had parked that component mm -hmm. because I thought from a logical point of view, I just, at the time, uh, it was too hard for me to contemplate um, a man who had 1,200 counts or whatever it was at the time of corruption against him, load yes. shedding, an, uh, an alleged rape charge, whatever those things were at the time, becoming our president. I just mm -hmm. thought, you know, this is, you know, a, as much as I was a, um, a, a deep, deep believer in people like uh, Walter Sosulu and Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I guess the uh, the moral leaders um, mm -hmm. that we were hoping to lead our company, our country. I now saw a man that was the antithesis of that. You know, mm -hmm. um, Governor Becky. I mean, a great giants. And then you suddenly had this guy, and I thought, no, 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 I can't. Uh, I'm not prepared to live in this situation. Right. And so you mm -hmm. park mm -hmm. all of that deep emotion that you have and the love and everything for mm -hmm. a logical decision. But when you say to me now. Um, what have my kids gained by growing yes. up in South Africa and not in Australia? Well, they grew up with their grandparents on both right. sides. Right. You know, mine have now passed, but, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they had the deepest love um, from my parents and from and from my wife's parents, you know. Right. They've grown up with Shabbats and Friday nights around, you know, with family. Um, we've celebrated uh, so many joyous festivals and occasions with our friends. You know, mm -hmm. I've had the joy and the privilege of starting a company from scratch as opposed to simply leading a large company. Right. And it's a very different skill to kind of be CEO of a big corporate as than it is to kind of start something with on your own, basically, yes. and build it into something. You know, that uh, you learn a lot through that as well. And the adventure I've had with my partners and my colleagues at work and my clients. Right. So there's an enormous amount of richness that I think has come through the decision to return. Um, okay. And I'm grateful for it. Fantastic. And I think that a lot of people are coming back to South Africa now because um, they're realizing mm -hmm. that the grass isn't greener on the other side. And it's always a trade-off. And uh, somebody said to me, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what is your simple observation about immigration? And I said, well, you leave behind everybody that you love uh, for everybody that you don't. <laughs> yeah. That's it. In, in a nutshell, that's uh, so important. I mean, yeah. just for, for that grounding and those roots. But talking about just the community, what makes South Africans so special? Um, I think South Africans are very real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think we wear our heart on, a sle on our sleeves. Um, I think that uh, you have authentic dialogues with South Africans. I don't think that we are schooled in the style of subterfuge and not right. showing our emotions. And and what you see is largely what you get, you know. Right. Um, I think South Africans are, are good people. I think we've got a lot of kind-heartedness in South Africa. Of course, we've got massive challenges. Mm. Um, and, and, and none of us, I mean, uh, can say what we would be doing ourselves if we were unemployed and had no prospect of putting food on the table desperate times call for desperate measures absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. you know our crime rate, our crime rate mm. is unacceptably unacceptably high um you know solutions need to be put, put in place to help people um out of poverty you know mm. and so um but, but by and large, when you look at the country and you look at the people and you look at the engagement, you look at the positivity and the solutions, you know, South Africans survive because of our sense of humor. We laugh mm. at things when they go horribly <laughs> wrong because that's how we survive, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, we do. Uh, we do, we do. Yeah. And we're a remarkable country in terms of uh, innovation, yeah. in terms of our ability to create, be it in medicine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the you know the most successful businessman in the world probably ever is a south african in terms yes. of elon Absolutely. Um, you know our advances in medical science and in physics and in telecommunications and in banking and in the creative industry and everywhere mm -hmm. you look south africans play um center court wimbledon on the world stage 
Uh, where do you see sort of, a, and from a positive point of view, because it's always, um, one of the decisions I made a couple of years ago was to limit the amount of information I bring into my head. So I picked, I pick people that I listen to and follow uh, yes. for info and, and, and you are one of them. So on that, on, on the, the, the optimistic Mike view, which, I mean, which is your natural yeah. view, where do you where do you see South Africa going, and what do you see as opportunities for people to build lives for themselves? I think that we are at a very important point in the mm. history of this country because we are, you know, three decades in uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. ANC. Um, I can't say leadership, that's not the right word, mm. um, controlling parliament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, yeah. You know, and, uh, and I think that uh, whereas we saw, you know, inc an incredible uh, constitution being created, whereas we saw yeah. unbelievable world leadership through uh, Nelson Mandela mm -hmm. uh, and then through uh, Thabo and Becky uh, putting his... Uh, um, AIDS denialism aside, which was obviously hugely problematic. Mm. Um, where we are now is the only way for South Africa to improve is for South Africans to make smarter decisions about their, right. their lives right. and their choices. What I mean by that is the only way out of poverty is through investment, domestic and foreign investment. There is no other way out of, po out of poverty for this yes. country because domestic and, uh, and foreign investment creates jobs. And you won't be able to attract domestic or foreign investment without a fertile environment for that. So mm. a working infrastructure is critical to investing in South Africa. Uh, a stable workforce is critical. Um, um, cutting unnecessary red tape, being mm -hmm. investment friendly, mm -hmm. um, enshrining the constitution. So there are a lot of things that um, have to be preserved and protected in order for us to to attract that because today people can choose to put their money anywhere in the world and yes. why would they choose here well they'll choose here because they can get hopefully best of breed skill i think yeah. the devaluation of the rand hasn't helped people living in south africa but it's made us a very attractive market for people to invest in and yet at the same time uh, our, my wife and i were invited to a dinner party um, on saturday night um, and our host were, uh, was a Swedish couple that live mm -hmm. in um, where we live in our apartment block. And the other two couples that were there from, were from America. Mm. And they were absolutely raving, all of them, about South Africa and what it's like to live here. Um, and, uh, and, and why wouldn't they be? Because it's all true. Uh, they weren't blind to the challenges. But right. what they were quick to point out is that every single country has its challenges. And so would I want um, Putin to be my president or would I want Trump uh, to be my president or I mean, even Biden, I guess, mm -hmm. or would I want, you know, um, uh, I don't know, Boris Johnson or whoever to be my, I don't know, you know, so right. well, I do. Um, and so when you look around the world, the world, there's so much change. And I think that what we have over here is good-natured people that can make a difference if they're allowed to make a difference. And so that's what I'm hoping for. Okay, fantastic. And I think you know, just a, a follow-on question from that, a little off the topic. What, what is so special about Cape Town? The, the, my, this is my personal question. <laughs> so, I mean, oh, coming from PE, a very, I'm there, so Quebec, I'm there, please God, tomorrow if my back's okay for the South it. African Bench Press Championships at uh, Recife, Cape Recife High School. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just the right. summer strand. So, yeah. But the, okay. what, what if you were going to live, obviously, anywhere in South Africa, you're living in mm -hmm. Cape Town. What's so special about Cape Town? Well, I can't say the sea because there are many mm -hmm. cities in the world that are the sea, but I can say the mountain. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we blessed with obviously you know this unbelievable natural asset in the middle but the city mm -hmm. has an incredible energy of creativity of possibility right. of potential and mm -hmm. you know it's it's visceral um there's no doubt in my mind that uh, cape town is the next great african city 
You know, right. when you see the investment that's coming in here into um, technology, mm. for example, is unbelievable. Um, you know, uh, venture capital uh, companies that are setting up over here because they know they've got unbelievable talent and an unbelievable lifestyle. And I'm not sure in Palo Alto yeah. if you have an unbelievable lifestyle anymore. <laughs> San Fran. You just have you know. traffic, yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> right. We okay. have, we have, no, I think that what we've got mm -hmm. is, there's, uh, it's a melting pot of cultures. So there's mm -hmm. an enormous mm -hmm. amount of diversity. Um, our natural assets in terms of tourism are amongst the best in the world. I mean, it's not for s no small reason that Cape Town gets voted number one or yeah. number two best city in the world to either visit or live in. And yes. there's a lot of competition in that regard. Absolutely. And that's not an award that we give ourselves. That's an award that's given to us. Mm -hmm. When you look at the number of planes uh, that are landing in Cape Town over season, um, it's unbelievable how many tourists are coming in here. If you look at the wine industry, if you look at the hospitality industry, the food, uh, and all of that that is supported through hospitality mm -hmm. and tourism. And when you've got one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful city in the world, that's a great job creation opportunity and the long tail of that, be it wine, be it food, mm. be it farming, be it agri. Um, so I think, and we've got um, the city works, you know, fortunately yes. the municipality is well run. So um, yeah, I think that the future is bright for Cape Town. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's a very, very special place uh, to be. The, just as a question, if you were back to the youth, Mm. Coming out of school, no opportunities, potentially no prospects. What would you advise them, perhaps in terms of working for free, which is a big challenge when you, you know, you need to be contributing to uh, your family and so on. But how not to lose hope, how not to sink into despair? You know, working for free is... Uh... A massive challenge because mm. just your transport is going yeah. to cost you a thousand rand a month mm. uh, to come into work so when your family is on the bread line and you know there might be one person working in the home or there yeah. is a social grant um, there's no possibility actually to to consider working for free even if you'd mm. want to even if you want yeah. to get your foot the door um, I think that um, there are unconventional things that many South Africans do in terms of, you know, trying to uh, get bursaries, um, mm -hmm. trying to um, work from places where you can have free Wi-Fi and use the data that mm -hmm. way, whether it's shopping centers, whether it's, you know, malls or um, NGOs that are set up in terms of access to education access to learning, access to wisdom, access to skills. Mm -hmm. So if you had to say work for free will, um, learning to become an artisan or, you know, um, I know that there's a shortage, for example, of artisans um, within the townships, you know, that if you want a handyman or if you want a builder mm -hmm. or if you want a plumber or if you want to, you, uh, it's not easy to get somebody because a lot of those people are not working in those areas and they are, you know, leaving in the morning to go and work in other areas, yes. in more affluent areas. And so I think that there are different ways of looking at it. I mean, one of the other things that I've tried to encourage in South Africa for many years is... Um, the subsistence farming methodology, mm -hmm. much like the kibbutz system, right. where people can actually, because we do have land and where mm -hmm. people can um, learn skills um, and then at the same time um, uh, grow stuff, you know, in yeah. order to put food on the table. And I think that we are not applying creative or fresh thinking in how we solve our problems. I think we're approaching it in a very traditional way. And so I think that there is an opportunity for us to think a little bit more creatively in terms of how we unlock opportunity. And with almost 100% smartphone penetration, mm -hmm. there's a huge ability in terms of being able to leapfrog your, from where you are currently to where you could be through access right. to, to education, to job opportunities, whatever they, those might be. But the challenges are immense. So what can South African business owners and corporates do differently or better 
in order to assist those young school leavers that are coming through. This incredible resource that we have, that if it's put into the right environment, can cause the whole country to thrive and to grow. Yeah, well, I think that uh, I look a little bit frozen on your screen. Mm. Maybe I'm back. Okay, there. okay you're back. Cool. You're back. Great. <laughs> yeah. So um, our job, I think, as humans is mm. to share and to try and make the world better, to have a, a sharing culture and to have an inclusive economy. And how can we use our companies and our own resources in order to not just be driven by the tyranny of the bottom line, but right. to try and make the world, you know, a, 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 a slightly better place. So, for example, you know, I've got my street store movement that was created mm -hmm. by MNC Saatchi Able 10 years ago, where we've clothed uh, over a million people around the world because of the generosity of others. And those, you know, pop-up stores with posters right. um, that, uh, that's that been transformational in, 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 in small ways and in big ways. Can you tell and us a little fact, bit more about that? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. It's called the street store. And people mm -hmm. can go to the streetstore.org is the website. And it's the world's first rent-free, premises-free, free pop-up clothing store for the homeless or the needy. And so people can download four posters. They can host their own street store. There was one in Boston last weekend. We've been wow. in Nepal. We've been all over the world. Um, and... Uh, and it's a great way of bringing dignity to both the, the giver and the receiver, actually, as it yes. happens. Because, right. you know, even when my wife works at a street store and she leaves, she says, I actually got more out of this experience than I think the people did in re receiving the clothing because of the, the purpose and the meaning that comes from it. Absolutely. Um, so I encourage sure. people to, to, to look at that. But the other thing I was going to say is mm. bursaries. You know, I've got a number of kids on bursaries. Um, and, and I think that's a meaningful thing to do, to empower mm. people through education. Education is the passport out of poverty. Um, the tragedy is that there are a lot of people that are educated or even doctors today that are sitting at home that have mm. got huge student loans and can't find jobs. I mean, that mm. is untenable and it has to change, you know. Mm. And I can't understand why we would bring one doctor in from another country in the world when we've got our own doctors that don't have jobs. And so right. I think uh, the onus is on us to lean heavily into providing opportunities, um, big or small, uh, for South Africans. And, uh, you know, you look at, um, you know, Gidon Novik's um, food harvest mm -hmm. truck that delivers food around at night, you know. And, uh, and there are many of those types of amazing initiatives, you know. So many things like my Africa Tikkun, mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on and on of outreach programs that corporates uh, and individuals are bringing to South Africa. And I just think that that is the way. I think you would have a sharing culture. I think that, you know, they say it takes a, a village to raise a child. And I think that, uh, you know, it takes a village to, to protect people. You know, you can't say, well, I'm okay, mate. I don't need to worry. That's not something that is even a possibility. And the world is filled with extraordinary people that make a difference. And the world is filled with selfish people that are as rich as God, but mm. um, miserable. But as, but as poor as a stone. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. As they say, people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So, Mike, it's such a wonderful point, and it's a great. I know we're running out of time, but what is what is being of service to so many meant to you? What has it brought to your life? Um, definitely a sense of purpose. Um, and not in a lofty way, but if you can help people big in big ways or small mm. ways, why wouldn't you? Sure. Yeah. You know, what kind wow. of a, a life is it that you that you want to live your life having, you know, a whole lot of material objects um, to look at or to flaunt um, when you can actually be changing other people's lives? Um, mm. I don't understand mm. that at all, you know, and I'm not judging people. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. And it's certainly not like I don't have a good lifestyle. Of course, I do mm. I have a, a fantastic lifestyle, thank God. Uh, and I'm very blessed for that. And I've worked extremely hard for it. <laughs> but, mm. 
but um, I do understand the concept of enough, and most people don't understand the concept of mm -hmm. enough, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, and I come across people often that have got very little, but are still deeply involved in helping, in charity, in giving, and people that have got tons that don't do any of that kind of stuff. And I can't work that out mm. because to me, part of being human, part of being of humanity, you know, uh, my grandfather and well, my, I'll tell you about that. So my grandfather mm. worked for free um, as a maxillofacial surgeon one day a week for 40 years. Every um, sure. Thursday, he'd go and work for free at the Livingston Hospital in PE. It was a black mm -hmm. hospital because he wanted black patients to have the same uh, dental care um, as white patients mm -hmm. and to be able to spot, you know, oral tumors and all of those types of things at the earliest possible stage in order to save lives. Now, if you are not working as a dentist or as a maxillofacial surgeon or as a doctor, or whatever, you're not earning. And yes. so to give up, you know, 20% of your earning capacity to make a difference. The same with my mom. I mean, my mom was a very brilliant lady um, and, uh, and an academic, and she had her own real estate company as well. But every, every week, whether it was on Saturday night or Tuesday night, she would hop into the ambulance of the Livingston Hospital and travel around the township and stitch up people and deliver babies and take pandas out of people's heads. And I've never had that courage, you know, to, mm. to us, well, I don't have the qualifications either, I guess, but um, it takes a special kind of a person that says, you know, I'm here for a finite period of time and I want to try and make the world a slightly better place. And I don't say that because I'm any paragon of virtue. I'm not, mm. but I just think that we shouldn't uh, lose sight of the fact that in order to lead a life that matters, it's about contribution. It's not about taking. It's about giving. Sure. I think that that's probably the best message that we've ever had here, that if you can help, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Mike, is there anything sort of you would like to add before we, before we end? Yeah, I think um, for me, the amazing thing about South, South Africa is we mm. literally have everything here. Like mm. There's nothing that we don't have. We have got agriculture, we've got land, we've got tourism, we manufacture cars for the rest of the world from here. We manufacture the most, uh, you know, complex things. Our banking is world class, our telco is world class. I mentioned earlier, our creative industry is world class. You know, our architects like Stefan Anthony is designing homes all over the world, uh, you know, from here. Yep. Uh, so there's nothing we can't do. So if we make the right decisions, all of the assets to have a transformative effect on employment um, and overcoming poverty, they are all here. They just need, we just need as South Africans to make wise decisions, um, not identity-based decisions. And I think that there's mm. um, far too much uh, division in the world. I think far too many people judge each other, um, dislike each other based on nonsense like um, race, religion, gender, sexuality, all of that is rubbish. Just be a good person, you know, as mm -hmm. that saying mm -hmm. goes, I think it's something like, uh, don't be a doers, be lecker or something yeah. like that. Absolutely. You know? yeah. and, uh, hey, and, uh, and I think that's what I want to say is that we have every single thing here right now to mm. make this country boom. And it's only the decisions that we make that are going to prevent it from booming or going to enable it booming. To boom, absolutely fantastic. Mike, um, a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much for your time. We Thank really do inviting. appreciate it. No, it's been Great absolutely pleasure. wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to end the recording now and then I'll just chat to you quickly afterwards. Cool. Thank you, Mike.